Welcome to Context TV. We are now talking to Kumi Naidu here in Glasgow at the COP26. Naidu is a human rights and environmentalist activist from South Africa. He was director of Greenpeace International until 2016 and secretary general of Amnesty International until 2020. He is at this time fellow at the Bosch Stiftung in Berlin. Welcome to Context TV, Kumi Naidu. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to have you. You have been fighting for a real solution to the climate crisis for a long time, committed to acts of civil disobedience and were arrested. If you turn back, where do we stand right now here at the COP26 in Glasgow? Has anything changed in the last years concerning climate policies and also concerning the global movements who demand a rapid shift in course. Thankfully, there is something that has shifted, which is that the number of people in the world who now understand that we need to act with urgency to address the climate crisis. Uh, there are many people who recognize, while our governments don't seem to recognize, that we are living in the most consequential decade of humanity's history. What we do in the next 10 years will determine what future we have or whether our children and their children will have a future at all. But I'm sad to say that if you look at where the science and extreme weather events are and where the politics and the economics is, there is still far too big a gap. Our leaders here are in denial that in fact we are running out of time and that we are one minute to midnight and the window of opportunity for us to act is small and is closing fast. Thankfully, there is a groundswell of resistance that is coming outside the COP, a little bit inside the COP, but we have a long way to go before we can get our leaders on side with us. Our leaders seem to believe that it's still possible to make baby step changes and sell it as if they're doing something big and basically they are trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic while humanity is sinking. Uh, the approach of our leaders is still very much the same like we saw at the end of the global financial crisis which was all about system recovery, system protection, system maintenance. What was needed then and what is urgently needed more so now is system innovation, system redesign and system transformation. And sadly, the majority of, of, of our leaders in government are not up to the task because they are far too in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. Let me just end by saying, do you know which is the biggest delegation at this COP? The fossil fuel industry. The, the oil and gas companies are twice the size of the largest uh, government delegation, which is the UK government delegation. To put it in context, it's like, imagine Alcoholics Anonymous were having a global conference and the largest delegation to that conference was the alcohol industry. That's how crazy this COP is. And that's why Mary Robinson is correct when she says that this COP is male, pale and stale and it is the most elitist and exclusionary COP that we've ever seen. Greta Thunberg just said that, that this COP is the most exclusive when it comes to representatives of uh, the Global South and indigenous people. Why is that? That is because our global governance system, right, including the United Nations, is still dominated by the richest countries on the planet. And they, have, they say one thing because the UK presidency said they were, this is going to be the most inclusive and most diverse COP and so on, but it's actually completely the opposite. And they believe that if they say it often enough, that people will actually believe them. But I have to say, this one has been stunning. It's because it's all about power at the end of the day. Who has power gets here. And yeah, the cost of participation are very high. The ability to get your sort of uh, accreditation yeah I mean I heard a horrible story about an artist from the global south whose art is being displayed inside the cop but she has not got the registration to come to see her own art for example right and at a time when it's clear that the wisdom of indigenous people is needed to help us get out of the climate crisis because indigenous peoples have understood for centuries for millennia that humanity's well-being 
is when humanity can coexist with nature in a mutually interdependent relationship. And unless we get to that point, we are not going to win. And so, and, and also, people from the Global South, frontline communities, indigenous peoples, when we have been inside here, we say the uncomfortable things. We say that, uh, you know, we say that most of our so-called leaders are basically become agents of the fossil fuel industry. The fact that Transparency International, based in Berlin, who had to issue a statement just 10 days before the COP started, calling on the UK presidency not to collude with the fossil fuel industry in the planning of the COP. Even fossil fuel industry interests were involved in the planning of the COP as well. So, you know, the power dynamic is one that excludes people. But just because people are not inside, the leaders here must recognize that the whole world is watching and they might get away with it now in the next couple of days and come up with a wishy-washy statement that, you know, they will pat themselves on the back and say we've done well and so on. You can guarantee they're going to do that at the end, right? And sadly, even the poor countries will be forced into a situation to pretend actually that we've made progress. But in reality, progress can only be judged by what the science is saying. And the science is saying we are far away from what we need. And for that reason, we need to broaden this uh, resistance, uh, build the movement even stronger than it is. And thankfully, uh, uh, to put it in a different way, our leaders must recognize that they are playing political poker with the future of our children. They need to understand that nature does not negotiate. We cannot change the science. All we can change is political will. And thankfully, in quite a large number of countries, political will is a renewable resource in the sense that when people don't perform, we can get rid of them. And I hope that those leaders that don't deliver here, when they go back home, when they face elections, that their citizens will put them out of power and bring people who recognize the urgency of the climate crisis. Talk about climate finance, um, which is crucial for poorer countries. South Africa just got $8.5 billion dollars to phase out coal and invest in renewable energy. What is the significance of this financing and could it initiate real change in your view? So this package is a good positive package if firstly the rich countries deliver what they said which 80% of the time they make promises and they've not delivered. Bear in mind it was in Copenhagen in 2009 that they said that they will make sure that there's 100 billion dollars per year in the Green Climate Fund. We are in 2021, one year later that still not happened. Uh, we are not seeing the money for adaptation going to poor countries that they promised. So if the money is delivered on time without strings attached, without political manipulation, that will be a positive thing. And we hope that will happen because South Africa, my country actually, uh, has also not done well and this will help accelerate the progress to get off coal which absolutely we have to do. Then the other problem is what happens when the money gets there. We need to make sure that the South African government and as a citizen I'll be calling for this and pushing for this, that the South African government is held accountable for how that money, every cent of that money is spent. And I call upon President Ramaphosa as I've done in other interviews to bring together senior leaders of civil society, religious leaders and so on, to play a monitoring role to ensure that how this money should be spent is how it is spent. Because sadly, there has been industrial scale corruption and looting in South Africa. And right now, it, we, we would be foolish to think that just because there's money, all that money will be spent in the way that it needs to be spent. Let's go to the issue of carbon inequality. A study that just came out says that the carbon footprint of the world's richest 1% is on track to be 30 times higher than what's needed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. What follows from that in your view? So this statistic about how the overconsumption by the people at top of society is what's driving the climate crisis is something that we need to come to terms with. You know, for example, when I was the head of Greenpeace, oftentimes people would ask me, including Greenpeace members in rich countries would ask me, so Kumi, isn't the big problem is population? You know, the people in Africa and Asia are having too many babies, for example. 
And by the way, I believe that we need to address the, the population. And the way you address population is by ensuring full gender equality. Right? If we work for full gender equality, population starts coming down. And I support that. But actually, when you only look at population and you don't look at consumption, you get a very wrong picture. It probably takes at least 100 children in an African village to equal one uh, child's consumption in Berlin, for example. Right? So also this is a fact that, that, that outlines a troubling reality. And that is that the worst disease that humanity faces is not COVID, not influenza or any other disease. It's a disease we could call affluenza. Affluenza is a pathological illness where people have been led to believe that a good, meaningful, decent life comes from more and more and more material acquisitions. So this is something that has to be addressed and that's why it's clear. We cannot get out of the climate crisis if we leave the current economic system intact. The current economic system has been what has driven us to this point of climate catastrophe. And we need fundamental changes to our economic system, our energy system, our food system, our transport system, and so on. And anybody thinking that, oh, it's just a question of a few minor changes here, especially when we've left it for so late. You know, if governments were responding to what the science was saying prior to 1992, we might be able to say, okay, we can take it gentle. Right now, we are playing catch up. Let's be clear. The terrible, sad thing for somebody like me who comes from, a, from Africa is being so aware that the people on my continent and the people in the global south have contributed so minimally to the problem, right? But are paying the first and most brutal price now. Their lives being lost now. There's infrastructure being lost now. And, you know, look at this cop here, right? <laughs> you know, where are those people, right? And... And unless we understand that the problem we're facing is also climate apartheid, those parts of the world that contributed most to the problem have a particular complexion. Those parts of the world that are paying the first and most brutal price are mainly people of color. And why we are not surprised that climate apartheid is what we should call it, because if ever we had any doubt how rich nations, against the wishes of their own citizens most of the time, they proved their colors. They've shown the colors in the way they have addressed the COVID crisis. The vaccine apartheid, which is both not in their own interest, because ultimately you're leaving Africa, for example, as a variant factory, which could bring variants which the current vaccines might not be able to treat, as we stand here, people in Europe and North America and rich countries are getting ready for the third uh, vaccine shot, right? And people in Africa, 5% of people in Africa have got vaccines, right? So let's understand that racism is alive and well in the climate negotiations. And we need to call it for what it is and not pretend that just because we're all here saying we, we are one family and so on, that racism does not drive some of the injustices that we see in this COP. You are calling together with hundreds of civil society organizations and Nobel laureates for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Tell us about it and why you think that that could put pressure on governments, especially of the industrialized countries. Given what the science is saying now, given what extreme, even if the science wasn't there, right? Extreme weather events are speaking more powerfully than the science. First, the extreme weather events fluctuations in drought and flooding uh, were mainly in the south you know look even a country like germany loses people in a drought right one of the richest countries in the world is already losing lives from climate impacts right it's happening on a bigger scale in the global south and so on so people must recognize given what the science is telling us that an investment of one cent in any new fossil fuel project is an investment in the death of our children and in the death of the future. So essentially, this is not a fundamentally new call, by the way. Uh, in 2015, uh, President Anate Tong of uh, Kiribati, Kiribati or called, spelled Kiribati in Pacific Islands, I was there with him in his home 
looking at how vulnerable they are with sea level rise and they basically and he joined i mean he led the call calling on rich nations for a moratorium on coal right but right now if we know that oil coal and gas are driving us to extinction it is not rocket science to say we should stop doing it you know it's it's not rocket science and especially when we know that there are alternatives and making the transition i'm not saying it's click your fingers and we can make it but with political will with urgency with the resourcing and so on it can happen much faster and i believe a fossil fuel non proliferation treaty will add impetus to that and i'm hoping that within the next short months that many small most countries of the uh, what's called the climate vulnerable forum the poorest countries who are in the front line they will sign and then we will call on the ethics of the rich countries like europe for example likes to believe that they are environmental champions at the right side and so on but bear in mind europe also fluctuates on this question and i challenge the european union if they are as good on climate and environment as they think they are and if they are representing the views i mean there's no question in my mind having worked around the world that citizens in europe are amongst the most conscious about environmental issues right more so than most other parts of the world and their governments are actually out of step with them quite a large time right and so i challenge the european union to as a block sign the pro uh, non proliferation of fossil fuels treaty and start making the changes that they should have started doing long long time ago a new global carbon removal partnership was just launched explain what uh, it is exactly as we have different kinds of removal like ccs technologies carbon capture and storage or natural forms of binding carbon and then there is the problem of countries pricing in removals in the future to keep burning fossil fuels right now so what is this initiative about so firstly let me say that in 2009 say when we were in copenhagen i would never have considered the issue of carbon removals because that would have given the polluters the excuse to continue burning fossil fuels and to say well ah there will be technologies that can suck carbon down and so on however in 2015 when i was in the pacific i learned a slogan which brought tears to my eyes people were chanting 1.52 stay alive 1.52 stay alive and it was hard to hear that six months later when i met some of the same folks at the paris climate negotiations and they invited me to come and say a few words at a rally that they were doing and i was starting to chant 1.5 to stay alive and they said stop 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 the slogan has changed and the new slogan was 1.5 we might survive 1.5 we might survive and if we are almost at 1.2 now right and racing towards 1.5 we have to say how do we save the people in the pacific island states on coastal regions in various countries like bangladesh ghana other parts of the world uh, uh, the caribbean and so on and i call on people to refuse to refuse the fact that we can just let those people die and let their cultures and the histories be wiped out which it seems that big powerful governments are willing to allow happen so if you're going to do that we have to get serious about exploring in a transparent accountable consultative way about how can we find science based solutions not things where an industry suddenly says oh we have designed the stop ccs thing and we can suck out carbon and and make exaggerated claims if we are to move forward we have to make sure two things happen one is that whatever solutions are put forward that they are signed off by independent uh, the ipcc could play the role of signing off that this carbon removal the, the ipcc has already called for certain carbon removal strategies which are more nature based so in the last report they call for 
one trillion trees to be planted, for example, right? So, by the way, also planting trees is not as uncontroversial as people might think, because the, the way it should be done is not with offsets which allow people to continue to, to pollute, but it should be done in a way that the communities where the trees are planted are consulted, especially indigenous peoples, that it is, you know, there are questions about what kind of trees, how you plant them, who, control, who maintains them, all of these. So there are solutions which need to be signed off, if you want, by a body like the IPCC. We cannot let the industry themselves, right, come up with solutions and then start demanding money, which is very, by the way, because of the corrupt nature we have between governments and big corporations. And, and you know, we, we, for so long now we've been saying we must stop fossil fuel subsidies. False. Mary Robinson was speaking in a meeting, she said, you know, subsidies, subsidies, subsidies. Why do people call it subsidies? It's basically people's taxes are being used to kill them, right? That is what is happening, people's taxes. And then they say, oh, renewables are too expensive. If you take, that, say, take the subsidies out of the equation, renewables are even cheaper than what people already are recognizing that renewables are becoming cheaper. So understand there's an economic plot here. It is, and, and the sad reality is many countries around the world, from the United States to UK to many other countries, the people who really control those governments are not the people who vote in the elections, but it's the fossil fuel companies. They control the levers of power. They, they can determine what information gets out because they have huge influence over the media and so on. But the good news is more and more people are reali uh, realizing this. And in that knowledge, hopefully, the resistance to the fossil fuel companies will uh, lead to governments eventually recognizing that even if those companies paid for the elections, right? I mean, I, I like to give this example of George Bush. George Bush, his election was bought lock, stock and barrel by the fossil fuel industry. And if you go look at his track record for the eight years that he was there, he faithfully served the fossil fuel industry, right? I mean, you know, the why in Iraq, which was an illegal why in terms of international law, they eventually call it Operation Iraqi Freedom. I understand it was originally called Operation Iraqi Liberation, but then somebody said Operation O, Iraqi I, Liberation L spells oil. Maybe we should change it to freedom because it'll be too obvious. Everybody now knows that the devastation that we saw there, and you know, it's not that the US is, is committed to democracy. They collude with the most undemocratic nations in various parts of the world, historically and presently. So, but the other challenge we have is that the media environment in which we operate in is also heavily influenced by the fossil fuel industry and its partners. And that is why people get a very narrow slice of the truth. But as we used to say during the struggle against apartheid, you can fool all the people some of the time. Some of the people all the time. You cannot fool all the people all of the time. And the time for the fossil fuel industry, I believe, is, is up. You are a fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. Tell us about it and what you think about climate politics and climate movements in Germany. I've just arrived in Berlin about six weeks ago as a fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy. I'm doing two things while I'm there. One is I'm asking the question, why is activism failing? and what needs to change, because if we say it cannot be business as usual, it cannot be uh, government as usual, we must also be strong enough to say it cannot be activism as usual either, right? Uh, and, and we must be humble. You know, uh, Albert Einstein once said that, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to div get different results. And so, as in the activist community, we must also ask ourselves, what should we continue doing? What should we stop doing? What should we start doing? Because we cannot pretend that we are winning. When we are so, we are, when we are one minute to midnight and we are running out of time, we must have the humility to recognize that we can be better than what we are. We, ha we cannot be content any longer of winning battles but losing the war for justice, for climate justice, economic justice, racial justice, and so on. So the second, one of the reasons I think that we are not winning 
especially when we look at it from a climate point of view, is that um, climate, I, I, I used to say this when I was at Greenpeace, one of the biggest enemies of the climate movement is the climate movement, right? Because the way we talk, degrees, parts per millions, acronyms, 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 you know, which most of the conversation about climate is way above people's head. Even if a person is educated, a person struggles to actually follow. You know, I've got family members, many of whom are working class, who just say it's just too much. But now they're saying, but we can see the rain is coming when it shouldn't be coming, uh, uh, not coming when it should be coming, coming in quantities that are too much or too little and so on. But even if I look at educated people in my circle, they will tell you, unless they are like deep in climate, they say, man, we really can't follow the conversation. You'll talk in a language. And so the one piece of work which I'm quite excited about, I'm working with Olafur Eliasson, the artist who's based in Berlin, who's a big inspiration to me and to many people. He's done amazing work. In fact, I think somebody like Olafur has probably done more for climate awareness than many NGOs have, who have very big brand names and raise a lot of money, uh, his impact because he's able to evoke emotion, make the conversation accessible to people and so on. So with Olafur and other artists, I'm hoping to pursue the question, how do we bring the world of arts and activism together? What is in the jargon called artivism. It's happening all over the world, by the way, in pockets here and there. It's looking at how do we do it on a scale that helps us to communicate to ordinary people who, who, who have to work 20-hour days and 18-hour days and 12-hour days who don't have that much time to read books or go to a meeting and so on. We have to find a way to make the climate struggle human-centric. You know, if you continue to get people to think, well, climate is only about polar bears dying in the Arctic, which is, which is important, I care about that. But bear in mind, if many people who are living on starvation and, and, and their geographical location is so far away from the Arctic, for example, it's hard to expect them. You know, when they every day, whether they're going to have water and food for their children and themselves is a consideration. It's hard to expect them to have solidarity with, um, which ideally I would like to see that people have, because unless human beings recognize that unless we live in a mutually interdependent relationship with nature, we are on a suicidal trajectory, that we are on the path to extinction. And, um, and for all of those reasons, I think the um, climate movement in Germany, I'm very impressed with the young people in Germany, I've got to say. Uh, I've always been, you know, when I was the head of Greenpeace, I, was, I love the volunteers. Uh, the most, you know, they, they always inspired me all over Europe in all our offices. I think they are the backbone of all our movements, volunteers. And uh, I wish uh, that that inspiration continues to get bigger and pushes change much faster. The bottom line, though, is the election result in uh, Germany, while climate was very much high up on the agenda, we had 100,000 people on the streets before yes, the election. I was there to see, see that and, and I think that was super, super impressive. But I think for us to win, we need at least 10 million people in Germany on the streets because that's the scale of the problem. But I think that the foundation is laid and people must not wait for the next election. People need to recognize that we have to continue to mobilize in Germany, in Europe, in every country around the world if we're going to have a chance to convince our leaders. And I put leaders in inverted commas because oftentimes it's not worth calling them leaders because they're not acting with the kind of leadership that is needed uh, to convince them to act with greater urgency and to recognize that they cannot continue to drag the feet as they have done for so many decades when they knew, they knew before us, the fossil fuel companies knew before us that their own scientists were telling them this was going to happen. They hid the information from us and they also um, ensured that uh, when it came out that they 
used their billions of dollars to falsify the public debate and delay public action. And that is a crime and that is something that they need to be called out on. What gives you hope? Young people. I, 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 am, I, I, I get my hope from seeing young people, um, you know, I think young people are also bringing fresh lenses to the struggle. They are looking at old problems with new, fresh lenses, if you want, you know. And, um, and what I say to some of the young people, you know, who say, you know, they ask me, and it's hard, it's so painful to hear young people say, should I have children? I mean, asking me, you know. I get asked this question so much time. And, and how is it our generation can feel comfortable that we've left our children asking that question? And when some young people say to me, you know, Kumi, don't you think it's too late? I say, listen, I think the window of opportunity is small and closing fast, but so long as there's some opportunity, we fight. We fight, we fight, we are. But even if you think that it's too late, let's not go down without a fight, and let's not those that brought us to this point of destruction be left without consequences. Let us be clear. Let it be, be clear that it was not ordinary people who created the problem. It was those that had knowledge, that had money, who are part of the 1% brought us to this and let's, let's not go down without a fight. But still, I want to hope that we can go from such a small window of opportunity to a bigger window of opportunity and eventually to calm things down and that is why we have to uh, explore responsible, transparent, democratic, inclusive carbon removal initiatives that is peer reviewed by the science and that allows us to actually uh, bring the problem under control and also to do it in a way that gives us the possibility to definitely get not only keep it within 1.5, but over the long term, bring it back to at least one degree. And it's possible if we act together, it's possible if we have imagination, which is the most lacking thing from everything right now. If we have better imagination in our leaders, we'll be able to turn this crisis around. Thanks a lot for the interview, Kumi Naidu. Thank you.